Welcome back, everybody. We're speaking with Nick Coletta. Nick is an actor from Philadelphia. I was introduced to Nick by Eric, um, who appeared on the show a, uh, just last week. And Eric said that, listen, you need to meet this guy. You need to meet Nick. Uh, he started acting when he was older, uh, but he's so passionate about acting, he would be a great uh, person to have on your show. I, um, I, you know, I'm open, obviously, to all of these things, and I started looking at Nick's uh, demo reel, and I immediately saw, yeah, you know, this guy has talent. I, I you know, why didn't I see him on uh, Sopranos or somewhere, uh, somewhere else? Because he definitely fits that, that perfect uh, type. And um, then I started talking to uh, to Nick. So Nick, let's uh, let's share your story. Let's um, let's show how you know acting journey uh, is different from all of us. And the overnight success that people may be uh, talking about is really many, 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 many years in the process. So welcome to the program, Nick. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. So, um, for those who are not familiar with you, let's so let's do a little bit of a background. Um, I know that you were born and raised in Philadelphia, and I know that you started acting uh, later in life. Uh, catch us up uh, a bit uh, on, uh, to that point. Well, as you know, I've been doing stand-up comedy for 32 years, yep. and the way I got into acting was through stand-up. Mm -hmm. uh, after one of my shows one night, a gentleman walked up to me and said, we're having auditions tomorrow for this web series that I think you would be really good in. Okay. And I informed him that I never acted before. I do a character on stage. My stage name in comedy is Nikki Attitude. Mm -hmm. And that's because I have a Philadelphia attitude. <laughs> and um, I told him, you know, he asked me to come to the audition. And I said, sure. And it was for the role of a hitman. If I take my glasses off, you could see where the mob thing comes in, as I'm full Italian, part Sicilian. So mm -hmm. uh, I went to the audition and talked to the director, writer, and it was a web series uh, called Atlantic City Chronicles Revenge Season 2. So we had already done a full season. Mm -hmm. And talking to him, I get an email, this was on a Saturday, I get an email the following Tuesday, um, listen, the role that I wanted you for, I'm gonna recast. Hmm. And I'm, my first thought is, what did I do wrong? Yeah. And he said, I wanna put you in the lead role as the mob boss of the city of Philadelphia. And I emailed back, I said, listen, I've never done acting on camera before, he goes, don't worry about it. I'll direct you through it. So I did the series for him. Uh, we did six episodes. I was in four. And the night of the premiere, I sat there with my wife, Kathy, and who she's, she's my heart and soul. She really is. And as soon as I saw myself acting, I turned to her and I said, I need to take lessons. Because I could see myself on screen just waiting for my cue to talk. Mm. And I wasn't happy with my work. So I went and enrolled in one of the finest acting schools on the East Coast. And it's Playhouse West. I believe you have one out in L.A. It was started by Jeff Goldblum and Robert Carnegie. And a gentleman teaching here on the East Coast, my teacher, Tony Savant. You have to, as you obviously do with most classes, you have to interview and, you know, you sit there through the class and see if you're interested. And I saw a lot of great talent in that classroom that night. So I told him, you know, my background that I was a comedian. He said, oh, I love working with comics because you have a stage presence. And I was already into, I think, my 27th year of doing comedy. So I did have a stage presence. And... Uh, fell in love. I fell in love right away. I mean, this was my calling. I mean, comedy was nice. It's a lot of fun to get up and have fun and joke around with people. But the last few years of comedy, I found myself doing more of a Rickles act where to entertain myself by 
engaging with the people. Mm -hmm. And I started losing a little bit of zest for, for that art form. So I put all my effort and hard work into acting. And I told my wife, I started November of 95. I told my wife, if I wanted to do this, I have to go at it full time. And she told me, retire, retire from your job. I was coming into January of that year, would have completed 25 years with the Teamsters. Mm -hmm. I was a truck driver and did stand up at night. And I quit, I quit my job. I was able to get my pension five months later when I turned 57. So that was my income coming in. I have no debt whatsoever. My house is paid off, no credit cards debt. And I understand with the younger people how, how tough it is. You have to keep a day job to survive. My wife's a lot younger than me. She still works. And um, so I had, everything was perfectly set for me to, to dive into acting. Mm -hmm. There was two classes a week at Playhouse West and they were three hour classes. And I would do the 12 o'clock to three o'clock. Then all the students, well, not all of them, but a lot of them would go to either Dunkin' Donuts or Arby's and rehearse. We were just starting out, I studied the Meisner technique. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it's a lot of repetition. It's, I think for actors, it's probably the first technique you should learn because it teaches you to listen, which is, as you know, is the key to acting. You have to listen to your partner. Yeah. And so started doing the two classes and I told my teacher, I said, listen, I just retired from my job. I want to come to the night classes too. And he saw how passionate I was. So he let me do the night class at six o'clock. So when the class got over at three o'clock, instead of driving all the way home and then coming back, we would go to Arby's, we would go to Dunkin' Donuts, and we would rehearse. We would do repetition. And the people at Arby's were so cool to us. We'd give them a little business, but they would let us sit in the back of their restaurant for three hours and do scenes and stuff like that. I mean, they were so nice to us. I actually wrote a letter to the corporation telling them how nice the manager of the store was which they put up on the wall when they got the, you know, the thing from the corporation, which was really nice. So it gave us an actual rehearsal spot mm -hmm. to work at for three hours. And uh, so I started doing two classes a day for two weeks, uh, twice a week. So I was doing four classes, but every day in between I was rehearsing and I fell in love with the process. I'd rather rehearse than do a scene because you find out what the scene is about and you mm -hmm. find new things to do in the scene. You know, it's not about the words. It's about, it's about the emotion that you bring to the words. Yeah. So you find new emotions and everything like that. And I was hooked. I was hooked. And then when I got moved to advanced class mm -hmm. months later, Regular classes for students was Tuesdays and Thursdays. Advanced classes were Mondays and Wednesdays. I go to the advanced class on Monday. Tuesday, I show up and I take both classes. Wednesday, I take the advanced class. Thursday, I show up, I take two classes. I was doing six classes a week. Yeah. And I was rehearsing every day of the week, doing scenes, working with other actors. Did you, ever, did you ever come home? Uh, did, did your wife miss <laughs> Well, I would get home. My wife would go to work before me in the morning, and then I would go to the gym. Um, I'm a gym fanatic. I don't lift weights. I just do cardio. And I would do my workout, go to school, and I would get home at about 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, in the beginning when I was just in the first beginner's classes. Yeah. And I would have to get up for work at 4.15. And I told my wife, I can't do this. I want to do acting. And that's when she said to me, quit your job. We're fine. Just quit your job. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky. Yeah. Uh, that type of support is, uh, is, is needed, uh, especially as you're getting started uh, and you're doing things. And 
you know, so far, I think uh, um, the type of work that you've done is is local to Philly, or have you done anything outside of it? Oh, I've been to New York uh, quite a few times. I actually did theater up in New York with some Playhouse West students. We took a play up there. We were at the governor's room at the Royal Theater for a week, and we did a series of one-act plays, and I was in one of them playing the father. I, I know what my lanes are. I think that's really important for an actor to find. Mm -hmm is find your lane, find what you're best suited for, what, what characters that fit you, your look, your style, what you feel inside of you. And basically mine are mob guys, um, detectives, I've played corporate executives, I've played uh, fathers. Mm -hmm. now, now turning 61, I'm hitting the grandfather roles now which uh it's a little sad but you know you look back on your life and where did it go but yeah. uh yeah you have to find your lane i think it's really important for an actor to find their lane and to concentrate on that and research i mean youtube is probably the greatest tool for an actor ever especially nowadays i mean think of the guys that came before us they didn't have that right. and they did it simply through the process mm -hmm. I saw an interview with Al Pacino one time and he said that he loves the process more than anything and I agree with him 100% I mean I just find that really really a lot of fun especially if you're working with somebody that you really connect with so let's let's talk about the process. Um, you know, for for people out there, um, what is your process? The, how do you go about a role? Your cast, you know, your lane. So uh, I'm going to make an assumption that you understand the character before you get cast in some ways because that's your lane. But what is the process moving forward from there? Well, I, I think in the beginning when you first get your script, you, you got to see what you're doing why you're doing it and how are you doing it everybody you're, you're trying to achieve a goal you're you're wanting something you have to get it so how do you go about doing that and then the process for me is tons of rehearsal i have i've had actors over at my house every day of the week when i was at school and we would just rehearse especially if i was doing scenes and i would take on some serious scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Keller and all my sons, uh, I would take on roles like that, which I think, by the way, is everybody says that um, that the salesman is the greatest American tragedy. If anybody reads All My Sons, I think that's more tragic. It really is, in my opinion, but everybody but, has to. Yeah. Um, if we and you know your process uh, seems to uh, to naturally apply to theater and when you have actors when you have uh, time to rehearse uh what do you do and what is your process like when you're shooting uh, you know a film or shooting a short um oftentimes what i have found is that you have almost no rehearsal at all and uh you don't have a chance to meet with the other actors and it's basically all of your work that you have to do and be ready when you come on set then you have a little meetup. Uh, you kind of uh, you know play with the lines a little bit, and then you're done. And then you have to go over and over and over and do the many takes uh, that it takes to shoot something. So, what is your process when you don't have a chance to really rehearse? Well, since I don't have a day job, I have all the time during the day. Yeah. So, I have never gone to set not prepared, and I, I take pride in that. I mean, I study my script. I know my script mm. and I have when I, once I left school I went to school for three years and like I said yeah I took over 600 classes yeah. um, there was a student there who um, I found to be a terrific actor and this gentleman a lot younger than me um, took all sorts of classes juggling movement classes uh, speech classes he would he'd emerge himself in the in the business and it inspired me so I had 
asked him if he would come over. And here it winds up, we live a mile apart. Hmm. We actually live walking distance from each other. So when I would do a scene for a movie, I would have him come over and read the other role. And I likewise for him. So you got to find a good partner that you can work with yeah. and that understands you. And he really gets the emotion out of me. He really, just the way he delivers some lines. It's not, you know, it's what you feel in your gut, I think, before you say the words is what you should bring out. Is That's the emotion. Is you feel, you always, before you say something, you feel it in your stomach. Hence, you say it. Yeah. So if you can get that out of you, which he's able to do with me. Matter of fact, after I left school, I hired him to come to my house mm -hmm. and work strictly with me for two hours straight, twice a week. And we would just do all sorts of exercises that he would learn. He took classes up in New York, up in Connecticut, and he was well educated in acting. And I had him bring the things that I didn't learn at my school and teach me some of those. We did an exercise in my house one day. I tell people about it and they go, well, that's crazy, but it's not. He had me deliver a package to a door 20 different ways. How would I do it? And I found like maybe the 13th way, this is the way I would do it if I was mm -hmm. on film. Mm -hmm. So you got to put the work in. You have to put the work in. If you don't put the work in, you're not going to be a success. I mean, if you really want this, you have to work hard. It just doesn't come. When I started comedy, I'd go open mics every Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday night. Then when I got into comedy, it was the boom. You had A and E, you had MTV, you had all the shows doing stand up. So there was a lot of open mic nights, and I would go to every one and try to perfect my five minutes mm -hmm. that you needed to MC a show, build that up to 15 minutes. I had a friend who had a comedy club. He let me be the house MC. I got eight shows a week of stage time. So it was the greatest thing a comic could ever ask for is stage time. And the greatest thing an actor can ask for is stage time. So you have to really, really, I think, work hard. And if you work hard, you'll be successful. And I've, I've found that uh, I've been very lucky. I, uh, you asked me earlier if I work outside of Philadelphia. I've been lucky to work with Vanity Fair. It's owned by Condé Nast, or one of the biggest multimedia companies in the world. Yeah. And I got cast as a hitman. And they do this thing on YouTube called Reverse Film School. It teaches young filmmakers how to make movies. I did one for gaffers, which you know is for lighting. Mm -hmm. And my job was to sit in the booth and this gentleman walks into the bar and I got a grit on him. And that's all I do. I had no lines whatsoever. So again, the first, the three important things of acting is show up on time, be prepared and mm -hmm. be nice. Be nice. I mean, I think an important thing for an actor to do, and I don't want to sound like I know this business and I'm preaching, and it's just get friendly with the crew. Friend up with the voice guy, the guy that does your sound. Friend up with the DP. Friend up with the gaffers. Because the reason why is you're going to see them more on other projects than you will the director you're working for. I did a movie called Down Jersey that was in the Garden State Film Festival in New Jersey. And when I got on set for that movie, I had worked on another film with the sound guy. And he turned to the director, he goes, oh, you got net for this? And the director goes, yeah. He goes, oh, dude, you got a really good actor. And if you become friendly with these guys, they will give you mm -hmm. really good recommendations to the people that are important. Yeah, networking is important, uh, but it's it's also being genuine. I think uh, you're you're friends with them not because you're trying to be friends with them. I think you're friends with them because that's who you are, and they and they see that uh, you know just you know a hardworking person who cares about what he's doing. Uh, that's prepared, and that's what they resonate to. 
So it's uh, it's important. Let's let's unpack a lot of the things that uh, that you've mentioned because I want to dive into some of them. So when you were doing stand up, and you've mentioned that uh, character that you were playing, uh, Nick the Attitude. How did you create that character, and why did you choose that character as opposed to something else? When I was hosting at the nightclub that I spoke about, mm -hmm. we have we had a lot of acts come down from New York, and I noticed through the crowd's reactions to guys that were playing or women that were playing characters. Mm -hmm. And there was this one guy, John Bizarre, and there was a few guys that played a character role. And Dice Clay was big back then. Yeah. And he was playing a character. Actually, my friend Jimmy Schubert, who's a comic out in LA and has done a ton of film, uh, was his roommate. And I thought that I should create a character. So we're sitting on the roof of my buddy's club and we're trying to develop something for me. Mm. And my buddy said, he looked at me, he goes, you're Nicky Attitude, because you've always had an attitude. And okay. that, that bell went off over my head. And so I started writing my material about that. I started writing like things that I don't like about the government, things I don't like about going in the stores, and just things I don't like other people doing that are wrong. So what gives me an attitude is things I started writing about. And I, you know, I got my 40 minutes and I started going on the road and doing that. Um, I was laid off from my job as a teamster in 91 and I went on the road. I started in 88 doing stand up, and I went on the road in 91 doing comedy, but I hated the road. I just hated it. I hated the hotel room situation and I'm a diabetic. I had a hard time with the insulin. Okay. It had to be refrigerated. So I would have to get a hotel room with a refrigerator. And it was just it was just a hassle. It was a hassle to have that disease back in eighty eight. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't do the road anymore. So I hooked up with a couple of Philly bookers. There was this one gentleman who um, goes by the name of the Pickle Man. And the reason he goes by the name of the Pickle Man is because he has a company that sells pickles and horseradish and all that stuff to all the bars yeah. and nightclubs in the Philly, Jersey, and Delaware area. Well, he has his foot in the door already, so he would say to them, hey, do you wanna do, you wanna do a comedy show? I could bring it to you. Boom. I was doing so many shows a week for this guy. VFW clubs, American legions, you name it, firehouses. It was the first big show I did was in front of 550 people at a firehouse in Delaware. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was an awakening moment for me. It really was because the club that I worked at held about 225. But to have that double crowd, double the size, it was just like, wow. And then I started doing theaters you know, with 2,000 people in them and stuff like that. So, but having the diabetes back in the day, which just made it hard for me to be on the, made it really hard for me to be on the road. I get you. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I, there are a few things I want to uh, circle back to, but um, yesterday I had a chance to talk to a friend of mine, uh, Steve Bernstein. Um, Steve, before becoming an actor, uh, he was uh, he was behind the camera. He was a DP, and uh, you know uh, he has three Emmys and, and a Peabody to his name. And he said one of the ways that he uh, he got started um, with uh, CNN is because he was doing a kind of uh, subcontracting, and he was technically employed by a trucking company who um, got their start because. You know, anytime their trucker would uh, go by at night and they would see a fire, they would tell CNN about it. And they started carrying cameras and then they started, uh, you know, hiring people that were actually working for CNN. So I find it so interesting that, you know, the pickle guy already had an end to all the clubs doing completely different things. And he said, hey, I can bring you comics. And here's a trucking company um, <clears throat> or a tow truck company, rather that was bringing uh, you know, reporters to CNN. 
it's like it doesn't uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, compute, but it makes perfect sense in the other way that you get into the business uh, because an opportunity presents itself that you may not have thought or has nothing to do with your actual uh, business. I love that. Um, yeah. In, in terms of uh, you've mentioned that you know you've uh, you've done uh, stand up for a long time and you played in front of very small crowds and you played in front of theaters. What was, if we're going to say, kind of the the apex of your stand-up career? What would that have been? What do you mean by the apex of my um, career? The the highest, uh, you know, level, if you will, that you've attained. Uh, you've appeared on, you know, I, I, and I'm not into stand-up, but I'm just thinking that. Hey, uh, stand up, say that I played this theater or I've appeared on this show or I've done this. And that was kind of my, you know, the biggest thing that I have done as a stand up comic. What was that for you? Well, I, I did a few cable shows. Uh, I did one down in Ocean City, Maryland called the Beach Party. Uh, I did C uh, Comcast show, local Philly show. Mm -hmm. um, I did a few TV shows, but I think when I realized that, you know, this is far as I'm going to go, a lot of comics think they become failures if they don't get a sitcom, mm -hmm. um, which is completely untrue. I mean, if you can get paid in the business for 32 years, yeah. you're doing something right. And if people are still laughing and find you hilarious you know stand-up is without a doubt the hardest art form there is to do it really is because you have you're going in front of total strangers i love it where you get guys come up to you and go you know my buddies always told me i should be a comic i make them laugh and i just i i'm a non-violent person but that's the time that you really want to smack them because you want to say, I, I, I want to say to them, oh, yeah, you, you should try. I usually say, yeah, yeah, you should try it. But I'm thinking in my head, unless you're going to bring all your buddies to your show so they can laugh at your stuff, yeah. try doing it to 200 strangers. Yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, you're naked. You're standing there with just a microphone, unless yeah. you're a prop comic. And you're standing there with just a microphone. To get 200 people to listen to you and you could hear a pin drop while you're speaking that's you you've really done something really good you yeah. really done something really good so yeah. getting uh getting booked successfully i think is my biggest achievement continuing to get work and i open up for this gentleman now on his opening act he uh he's the biggest guy in radio comedic wise on in Philadelphia and his shows go from anywhere from 400 people to 2,500 people mm -hmm. and he was running uh, a show every Wednesday night up at Parks Casino and I got on that show and uh, opening up for him he, and plus he's a good friend of mine he, he actually did my toast at my wedding uh we've been friends yeah we've been friends for like 33 years um i think that that is the top the cream for me in comedy okay um have you as a as a stand-up comic just uh to kind of get your perspective on it uh my favorite uh, you know tv comedy uh, show ever is the marvelous mrs mazel um have you seen it uh, are you familiar with it uh, and if i am are, familiar with it but i haven't really gotten into it i saw one episode and i've heard you speak about this show before i should have done my homework and and <laughs> got on that uh but yeah i uh i'll tell you what mm -hmm. one of the funniest shows that i i think that i've i've seen in the last 30 some years and still going strong the writing in it is unbelievable is the simpsons and family guy yeah. that's my type of humor yeah that's that's my type of humor uh brilliant. yeah yeah brilliant writing on those shows um uh, but i will 
I will look into that show and I'll email you in a few weeks after I watch. How many seasons are in now? Um, three, I believe. Yes, three, three. seasons of uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. Well, I did, uh, in quarantine, I did five seasons of Peaky Blinders, so I could do three of that without a problem. You can. I think it, it may be, again, just from uh, from all of your years of experience doing stand-up, it may be some uh, something interesting for you. Mm -hmm. For me, when I started watching it, aside from loving the show, as an actor, I started getting uh, cold sweats just from seeing the the length of the material that uh, that Rachel Brosnahan had to remember and mm -hmm. to deliver take after take. I started thinking, is is this something that I would be able to do? Is, is that a possibility? I'm not sure. So that's that's me from an acting perspective looking at it. But as a fan, I think it's it's a remarkable uh, remarkable show. Um, let, me, let me give you a little cheat sheet information on stand-up. Most comics know their act, and basically they take the same act from club to club to club. Right. But when they write a new joke or something like that, I always do is I write it on a napkin, and when I get to the stage, I put the napkin down, and I put my glass of water on top of it so I don't forget it. So I make sure that I work that joke into my act to see yeah. the reception it gets. And if I if it does really well, then I just add that in. And you have to try to find a way to segue from one joke to that joke. Yeah. Um, I heard uh, Jerry Seinfeld talking about kind of the science of uh, of writing the you know stand up uh, routine that it's. Uh, takes an incredible amount of time and dedication and you have to understand that I'm going from here to here and then based on this I'm going to circle back to it and then I will get to my joke and if you just start out here it won't work you have to know the audience you have to know all of these things it's a science uh, that he's very proud of being uh, you know brilliant at so yeah I, I don't know anything about stand-up other than just as an outsider it's fascinating to me um, what you just said, Alan, is the most important thing about stand-up. And okay. what Jerry said is you have to know the audience. Yeah. So when gen when the comics before me go up, mm -hmm. I see what the people are willing to take, how far over the edge you can go. Mm -hmm. Because certain crowds don't want you to do, you know, certain material they, f they may find offensive or in this political world politically correct world that we're living in yeah you know so you have to jerry makes a really good point there you have to know your audience yeah um i just saw the uh, the new uh, special that he did 23 hours to kill uh it was fantastic i i yeah, loved, for a while. yeah i loved it and uh, again as as you know as somebody who has to memorize the material for a living you know seeing him do an hour of a lot of you know, material which seems easy, but it's it's that science, and you have to remember every single part. What leads to what? When do I do this? He does also, uh, you know, a lot of uh, kind of uh, physical uh, comedy. So everything needs to be worked in. I wonder, you know, how long it took him to go from this to the show. It it may have taken him years to get to that point. And I really respect uh, all the work that uh, goes into it. All right, it's a lot of hard work. You have to, yeah. you know, I, I used to tell stand-ups, I used to teach a class on stand-up, and my first opening line would be, I cannot teach you to be funny. And then I would hold up a pencil, I said, you must own one of these and write your own jokes. Mm -hmm. And then when you have your jokes, get in front of the mirror, do your act, see where you want to be when you deliver the punchline yeah. what kind of facial expression you want to make when you deliver the punchline mm -hmm. you get through your setup but bang when you hit them with the punchline you have to be in a certain spot and you have to have the face to really bring that across yeah so what um based on the wealth of uh, experience that you've had in the years of doing stand-up um what are you taking from it that's helping you be a better actor aside from the preparation and the work ethic which i think is just ingrained in you already but what else are you taking i think uh, 
the thing I learned most from stand up into acting because I've done stand up for so long is in mm -hmm. acting, you need to relax. You mm -hmm. just need to relax and do less. Do less. Less is more. It really is. The all this other than the, the guy who gets on the box and does the Shakespeare act and you don't need that. Do less. People people want to see less, like more non I, I love doing nonverbal stuff. When you're on camera, it's not about how many words you have. It's one the emotion you bring to the words, and even though you're not speaking, you're always in the scene. And an editor loves nothing more than to pick up an expression that you give when you hear somebody say something that, and I'm not talking a fake expression, something that you that you feel in your gut. And when they say they say something or they say a line, how you feel about that, that editor is going to put that into the scene. So you're never out of the scene, whether you have lines or not. So I think being able, having done my act for 32 years, I was so relaxed on stage. You, when you come out, when I come out on stage, you, you sort of know that I own it, and that's important. And it's important in acting. Own the stage. Mm -hmm. Don't don't show any signs of, you know, uncertainty or nervousness or anything like that. But I think being just relaxed is the most important thing. Yeah, makes sense. Um, You've mentioned Meisner. You started with Meisner. I uh, it took me a while to get to Meisner because I kept on hearing from people how weird it is and what it's trying to do and all the weird exercises you're doing. And then I finally took Meisner and I loved it uh, because Meisner took me out of my head. I'm, I'm very analytical. And, uh, you know, what improv did for me um, was similar to what Meisner did, which is just take you out of your head. There's no thinking and you're not focusing on yourself. You're not thinking at all. All you're doing is just trying to see what's happening and how you're affected by what's happening with uh, the person in the scene. And I love Meisner for that. Um, what did you find that uh, that seemed to click uh, for you? That exact, exactly what you just said. I yeah. think every actor that wants to act and decides, all right, I'm going to get some training. I think they should take Meisner first. Because my yeah, because my now my is difficult when you first start, but once you get the hang of it, yeah. it's very easy because all you need to do is listen, and he teaches you that it's not about you, it's about the person you're acting with. Yeah, and I think a lot of actors gotta understand and learn that, and Meisner's one of his quotes is. Be the actor everybody wants to work with. So if you're open yeah. and you're giving, that's who you'll become. Now, when I would pick scenes, I picked a scene from, did you ever read the play Light Sensitive? No. I with Jim Degan? It's a play about uh, a bartender and a taxi driver, and they drink one night, and the one guy gets blinded because the other guy put the cables on the battery the wrong way that blew up in his face. Mm -hmm. So now this guy that got blinded is a recluse. He doesn't come out of his apartment. So this guy wants to go out. His, his buddy wants to go on a vacation with this girl he met, but he doesn't want to leave him alone for like the week. So he brings in an aide. And this girl that starts taking care of this guy, they eventually fall in love. And I saw a scene in this play that I brought to an actress in Playhouse West, and I asked her if she wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was all her dialogue, practically. And she goes, why are you giving me this? Why? I said, because I think you would be perfect for it. And mm -hmm. I could play the nonverbal role of how you make me feel when you do this monologue that was in the play. I mean, it was a almost a two page monologue she had to do. And it was so moving that mm -hmm. when you listen to it, if you don't tear up, mm -hmm. you have no empathy in your body whatsoever. And 
It made me tear up every time we did that scene. And be the actor people want to work with. And that helps when you you pick a scene for your partner or you pick a scene that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Give the major role to somebody else and work on your nonverbal skills because that is acting. Steve McQueen, the best at it. I study all the actors. You ask me what I do with my time? Mm -hmm. I watch at least one old film a day. I just watched Baby Doll the other night with Carl Malden, who I think is one of the most underrated actors in cinema history, mm -hmm. along with Eli Wallach, who is another actor that if you just study their, their technique and what they do on screen, we learn so much. It's good to steal off of actors. Mm -hmm. That's one good thing about mm -hmm. acting. You're allowed to steal in comedy. You're not. But in acting, once I once I was told I could steal, it was like, let me let me go. And I I watch films. I take notes. I discuss them with other actors. I used to be in a group, the actors group, where I'd have actors come over my house. We would train. We would do scenes. We would discuss films. And I think you have to learn the history of your business before you get in your business. I mean, I think that's really important. It's really important to know. So, go ahead, sorry. Didn't mean to. Just, just to know, you know, everybody says, you know, Brando's the greatest actor and, you know, it's, it's hard to dispute, but there's a lot of actors out there like Lee Marvin and a lot of guys out there that if you study them, you'll mm -hmm. learn something. And that's really important. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm I love old films, but um, I guess I don't study them from that perspective. Um, I grew up, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I came here at 14 uh, from Ukraine. And uh, to me, musicals were kind of uh, my Hollywood uh, when I was growing up. So I grew up on musicals. I love, you know, Fred Astaire. I love all of these old musicals. So that's where my love kind of uh, came from them. Uh, you know, Gene Kelly, everybody else. Um, but when I when I study acting, I think it's more for me uh, anyway. It's more contemporary, and you know I uh, saw recently <clears throat> a show called Altered Carbon. Uh, it's on uh, it's on Amazon, um, I believe. If it's not on Amazon, it's on Netflix. I think it's on Amazon. I'll double check. I'm I gonna put that one down. It's called Altered Carbon. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, it has two uh, two seasons, um, and. Um, one of the actors there, and they're phenomenal actors there uh, as well. But uh, one of the actors there, he's playing uh, he's playing a smaller role. He's a regular, but he's playing a smaller role. Uh, Chris Connor, and um, just the way that he plays. Uh, in this case, he plays an AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a spin on Ellen Edgar Poe, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Excuse me. Um, the way that he plays that. Uh, to me, watching him is a masterclass in acting every single time, and uh, it's it's amazing. And he's not a he's not a huge star. He's not uh, a well known, if you will, uh, actor, but he's brilliant. And it's it's kind of discovering these people and things that I watch, and then going back and saying, oh my goodness, you know, that was amazing, and that elicited kind of emotion in me watching it. Um, those are the people who I who I kind of watch and rewatch and try to uh, you know pick up from, as you said. Mm -hmm. Well, contemporary guys today for me, yeah. one of the finest actors is Gary Oldman. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. you, you look at his work and you just I'm just blown blown away by his his technique, yeah. his what he does in in the professional. Mm -hmm. If you watch the professional where he plays the the cop. Yeah. Him taking the pill, him swallowing the pill. If you watch that scene alone, yeah. you're blown away. How he did that and the choice that he made to take the pill mm -hmm. with the neck and the, the thriving around, it's it's remarkable. I think contemporary-wise, he's my guy. But old school-wise, it's like you got to study McQueen. You, you got to study Lee Marvin. You got to study Brando. Yeah, there's 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 so many guys, you know, to look at. And uh, do you do you get TCM, Turner Classic yeah. Movies? I have a, it. Yeah. 
you can go on your I go on the demand and I I scroll through for a whole week what's coming up mm. and I just record them and during the day I have at least one or two movies to watch if I'm not with a script which yeah. during now is you know not during this pandemic which is which is tough yeah. it's tough now so I've been really engaging myself in watching old movies and yes. I think I, I think you can learn a lot absolutely um, you know Mark Rylance uh, for me is kind of the epitome <laughs> um, bridge of spies Mark Rylance you know that's that's the I think the only time when almost immediately I I turned uh, to I think I was watching with my wife I turned to her and said if he doesn't win an Oscar for this I don't know anything um, and that to me was okay I get it that's that's where I you know will aspire to be um, mm -hmm. okay so I wanted to ask you a few more questions uh, as as we kind of wrap up um, you started acting late uh, in life or later in life well, there's it, there is no late but later in life um, what are you finding in terms of uh, opportunities and in terms of uh, abilities is do you find that it hinders you because uh, you're starting older or do you find that it doesn't matter what has been your experience oh it's the complete opposite it's it's great mm -hmm. because when I was in school I was the oldest actor in the class yep. so I got if anybody wanted to do a scene with the father mm -hmm. they came to me if anybody wanted we had a few older actresses if they needed a husband they came to me. So I got a lot of scene work. Now, when I go into auditions um, for a film, say, and they're holding for the whole film, I'll see a room full of young actors, 20s, 30s, and the competition between them and my competition, there's four guys. Yeah, there's, there's like three or four guys. So... I find that to my advantage, that if I could make the right choice in the audition room, that I have a good shot, one in four, of getting the role. And they say if you do one out of, if you get one out of 10 auditions, you're doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm not bragging and I'm not being egotistical, but I got a, I got a, a very high percentage rate because guys your age, if they don't make it, they quit. Yeah. So now when it comes time for the older roles, the field is thin. So me getting into it and then like having the stage experience from doing a stand-up, I'm in an advantage. I'm very lucky. I'm extremely lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, no other way of putting it, I'm lucky. I'm just lucky. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, thank you for the compliment on my age. I'm not sure if you know how old I am. Uh, I, I'm 45. I started acting uh, really seriously when I was uh, in my early 40s. And, you know, people were saying, well, you know, you're starting late. And I found that to be an advantage because there are less, uh, you know, 40 year olds and I can play younger and I can play older. And I have that ability. Plus, I am an unknown, if you will. So a lot of the people, uh, if they want to use somebody who is not a well-known, accomplished uh, actor, but somebody that has talent that can do the parts, you know, I am uh, uh, an opportunity for them to kind of discover somebody, uh, somebody else. So I did not find that to my hindrance. I actually found the opposite. I'm glad you're doing the same. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Alan. Ten years from now, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot more roles out there for you. I get people, I'm on backstage, so I'm sure you are, if you're on backstage. Yes. I get people emailing me because they put in the profile that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And they see my headshots and they see my reel yeah. and they contact me. I just had somebody from Boston contact me to come up to Boston to play Stan Lee in a YouTube web series they're shooting. Mm -hmm. Now, with the diabetes, I don't know if I'm ready to travel yet. I'm going to try to push that off a little bit but you're going to find the older you get alan the more roles that will come to you trust me yes. yeah yeah Perfect. we're lucky we're lucky yeah. 
So um, to any actors or anybody who wants to get into acting who's watching this, if you think you're too old, you're not. Get into acting. There are all sorts of roles available. Um, you mentioned diabetes a few times. Let's uh, let's dive into that a little bit. You know, now with COVID, now with uh, kind of, uh, you know, the industry hopefully starting to get back uh, to some normalcy in a matter of months. Um, do you worry about uh, that costing you some jobs because you're in the, you know, quote unquote, uh, higher risk uh, category? Uh, I really haven't thought about that yet. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully my talent will overtake that. You know, if I get in the audition room, yeah. hopefully my choice, of what I do in the audition will override any medical problems that I have, which I really don't consider it a problem because yeah. I have a pump now, which keeps my blood sugar level normal throughout the whole day. Okay. I haven't said, so if my blood sugar goes up, it gives me insulin and brings it down to normal. If my blood sugar goes too low, it gives me a warning. And boom, I just eat something to bring it back up to normal, normal level. I was actually lucky. I filmed that second installment of Reverse Film School for Vanity Fair, March 7th and 8th in Brooklyn. Hmm. So it had just hit New York. Yeah. I did those two days. I was, I took gloves because I stayed overnight at the hotel. I took gloves. The face mask wasn't out yet. They weren't telling people if you wear a face mask, it'll help you. We nobody shook hands on set. We bumped elbows and did stuff like that. And uh, it, you know, being a diabetic and having a target basically on your back. I uh, I've been in my house now for three and a half months. Yesterday, I went out. For the first time, I went over to my barber's house to get a haircut because I looked like Albert Einstein. I mean, my hair was out like this. And it's another, uh, it's another lane you could have played. Come on, you should have taken some like, headshots. And then uh, my wife was digging the curls. My hair gets really curly. She was digging the curls, but I had a, a meeting this morning before yours. I, I just wanted to look like I look in my headshots. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people complain that if you don't look like you're doing your headshots, you know, da 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 da. Yeah. So I wanted to look like I do in my headshot. So uh, finally got out yesterday for the first time in like three and a half months. It was, you know, I took precautions. I, I wore a face mask. I wore gloves. Um, I feel good today. Hopefully, you know, I don't get anything. But, yeah, it's uh, unfortunately it could be a hindrance, but I don't think uh, it's going to bother me. And I don't think anybody – should not hire me because of that. Uh, I think you should be hired on talent alone. And uh, hopefully I have the talent that they're looking for. Yeah, well, based on your reel, I certainly think you do. Uh, and I appreciate that. You're welcome. And uh, hopefully with, you know, the uh, the therapies that are coming out, I read every day of, you know, more and more testing, not just for, you know, vaccines that are coming out, but for uh, all sorts of antibody treatments. So things are, seemingly in development and we should have them in the fall. So I hope that we get to a point where these are safe and uh, they're helping people. So it'll make things a much easier transition back into when, some normalcy. When do you think the industry will open back up? A lot of people are saying 2021. It depends on, on what we mean. And again, I'm no industry insider. It's just uh, from people who I speak to, you know, some people in New York are saying that uh, September they're opening things up. Um, in in Atlanta, I think they're starting to open up uh, earlier. So uh, you know, maybe July and uh, you know August time frame. Uh, Canada may be different because they have different laws and regulations, and they may open things up. It also depends on the type of production. You know, where if you're doing a big budget uh, movie, it's one thing, but if you're doing an independent film, so it's a smaller set and you have you know, ability to kind of manage it uh, differently, that may be uh, quicker. Um, so it it will vary. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see. You know, in Chicago, I think things are starting uh, to uh, to open up a little bit more. That's that's where I am. Um, we'll find out. Uh, I'm I'm hoping. And again, I have you know I have kind of three independent projects that are uh, in the wings. Two of which uh, would have been shot already that uh, we haven't done. And then a bunch of other potential additions that uh, 
that are awaiting. So we'll see. We'll see yeah. how it, uh, it all comes out. But I think right now the main thing is for us to stay healthy, to keep uh, keep working on our craft, and be prepared for the opportunities when they present themselves. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Um, last few questions. Um, what is your you know definition of your acting success? You you told me what your definition of uh, stand up success was. Now that you're in acting, and I see how passionate you are, and I see the incredible work ethic and uh, preparation that you're putting into it, what is your definition of your success as an actor? Having people that I've worked with come back to me and ask to work with me again. Okay. I've had directors, I've had uh, producers, uh, other actors say, hey, listen, I really think you'd be good in this project. I've worked for uh, three, three or four directors that shoot in Philly a few times. So getting a call back from people that you already have worked for, I think that's a major success because they like your work, they know you're professional, mm -hmm. and that's the most important thing. Just, you know, I, I always tell actors that are just starting out, be on time, be prepared, be nice. That's it. They're the three golden rules of acting. Mm -hmm. And if you do that and you work with people and you, you know, you have talent, you're prepared, yeah. you'll get callbacks. And callbacks are have been my success. Like Vanity Fair called me back to do a second installment of that. The first installment, I didn't say a word. I just sat in the booth. Second installment, I'm the lead actor. I have all the dialogue. And I get to work with a great New York actor who was in doubt about 30 Broadway musicals and plays. And just to be called back from having done something with them one time, I think that's the measure of success. I agree. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I started doing some, uh, a, uh, I had a audition for a tiny uh, role on a student film um, I did the audition. I got it. Uh, it was an overnight shoot. I drove, um, you know, from uh, where I live in the suburbs to the, almost downtown Chicago. I show up there. The director says, "I'm so sorry. Um, we're postponing indefinitely because <clears throat> my uh, crew just walked out uh, because they don't want to shoot overnights anymore." Um, I said, "No problem." And uh, I said, "You know, whenever you're ready, I'm here for you." And uh, he got back to me a couple of months later. He said. You know, thank you. Um, we're starting to gear up again. Um, I had an idea I wanted to run by you. I know that you know we hired you for this role, but I'm thinking of rewriting it, and I'm thinking of putting you as the main uh, character. Are you okay with that? I said absolutely. So uh, we had that schedule. Now um, I was prepping for that. He called me on you know a Saturday uh, or on Friday and said. <clears throat> Hey, tomorrow I'm shooting something uh, for uh, for school. DePaul University, one of the uh, you know top schools in Chicago in terms of acting schools. He said, mm -hmm. "I'm shooting something. Uh, I you know I have a role for you. It's a, it's a lead fun uh, character. You want to do it? It's tomorrow." I said, "Yeah, I would love it." So that one tiny audition for a small role in a student film so far has led to three films. And he uh, uh, called me recently. He's writing something else uh, for me. So you don't know. You know, be prepared, be nice, uh, get there on time, be ready, be professional, and you don't know what doors are going to open for you. Exactly. See, so yeah, that, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's what the the crew, especially the crew, is looking for. Because they don't want to be there all day waiting. You're, you keep flubbing lines and stuff like that. They don't, they're not going to be, they're not going to want to work with you later on down the road because you're, you're just going to hold them up. So, like you said, you, you were prepared, and that's the most important part, is be prepared. Because I've worked with actors that if there wasn't a script supervisor there, we, you know, we would have been in trouble. They just didn't know their lines, and, and it was frustrating. Yeah, and I was nice. You know, I, I came all the way down on an overnight shoot, and uh, at the last mm -hmm. moment, we're not doing it, and I didn't throw a hissy fit. I said, hey, it happens. I'm, I'm here for you. No worries. Uh, we'll, we'll work later. And we absolutely did. So just you know, be a normal person and uh, things will work out. Um, 
Thank you, Nick. I, I really, I really appreciate you coming out to the show. I, you know, when Eric said that I'll be inspired by uh, by your passion for acting, uh, I got inspired to do the interview. And speaking with you, I am inspired not only for your passion for acting, but just how much work you put into it. So, you know, it's it's one thing to be passionate and to present yourself as passionate for the craft. The other thing is to do something about it. And in watching you, and I hope that this is a takeaway that any actor or anybody else watching this uh, sees, is that you have to put in the work. And uh, Nick, you're, you're a perfect example of it. I wish you all of the best. I hope that uh, you, you know, get hired uh, everywhere and you do uh, the type of work that you can be proud of. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. And hopefully one day we'll get the work together. That would be great. I would love that. Yeah. Um, I, w I would too. I would too. And thank you for everybody for tuning in. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you for uh, for taking your time. We know these are you know not five minute conversations because we want to get to the depth of what it's like to have an acting life. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for commenting, liking, and sharing with your friends. We appreciate it uh, from all of us on the love of acting. Thank you.